Hello everybody and welcome to today's Daily Devotional. So our thought today is coming from Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17 through the end of the chapter, where Paul encourages the brethren regarding the type of life they're supposed to live as Christians and how it's supposed to be different than what they used to be. He says, starting in verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. Uh, As we mentioned yesterday in our sermon, a lot of times when the term Gentiles is used, it's meant to represent and carry with it the understanding of godless individuals. Not that the Jews were all necessarily uh, focused on serving God all the time. They weren't. There were times they weren't. And not all of the Jews did what they were supposed to, but they knew better. Uh, the Jews had been taught regarding Jehovah, they knew better. Uh, but the Gentiles represented individuals who were separated from Jehovah. Individuals who, uh, at, despite at one time having known of Jehovah and having known what was right, according to Paul in Romans chapter 1, uh, they, they chose to forget God. And so he uses the term Gentiles often to represent the idea of the godless. And so when he says you should no longer walk in a godless way, in a way that is only serving yourself and your desires as opposed to what God wants, in the futility of their mind, but he says futility of their mind to represent the understanding of their their thoughts and their focus, their purpose, it's all for this life. It's all for the flesh. It's all for the now. And there is no consideration of the truth of Jehovah, of the truth of judgment, of heaven and hell. None of that. It's all based on the here and now. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. He goes on to describe the depth of darkness that they're in. He says their understanding is darkened. And notice that this is, it's not that they never knew the truth as a, as a, as a category of people. Again, going back to Romans 1, they chose to forget God. They chose to ignore God. They chose to do what they wanted to do. They were alienated from the life of God because of what they wanted to do, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. They wanted to serve their own desires, and they no longer wanted to serve Jehovah. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness, with greediness. So he uses a couple of adjectives to describe the character of the godless. He says that they are past feeling. This is not to say that they were emotionless or Vulcans or something like that. It's the idea that they no longer, their consciences were no longer trained in such a way that they felt shame. They were beyond feeling. They were numb to any idea of sin. And it's kind of like having calluses over on your fingers uh, from playing guitar for a long time, or playing golf, or anything else, you kind of develop, a lot of times we use the word callous to represent someone who is no longer affected by certain things. Uh, Paul also uses the phrase uh, in other places regarding uh, having a conscience seared with a hot iron. And again, it goes to show that these individuals felt no shame for what they did. They had given themselves over, which is kind of the same phrase that Paul uses in Romans chapter 1 to describe that they, God gave them over to a debased mind. God gave them up to do this because they had given themselves over to these things. So God's not going to stand in their way if they want to do that. God's going to give them, allow them the free will to make that choice. There are consequences that are going to come with it, of course. But they'd given themselves over to lewdness. Uh, As we talked about yesterday in our sermon, the concept of lewdness, it's not just from a sexual perspective, although that certainly is a part of it. It, More broadly, it's uh, generally the idea of wantonness, lack of self-control, just kind of doing what feels good and not caring about whether it's right or wrong or even thinking about a standard of right or wrong. 
to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, I want you to notice that just because the Gentiles didn't register these actions and this, these characteristics as being unclean or greedy or lewd didn't make it any less so. God's law stands on its own. God's standard of right and wrong stands on its own. Whether you or I acknowledge that law is irrelevant. Whether you or I submit to that law is irrelevant. God's word, God's law that determines right and wrong still exists even if all of mankind were to say, no, we're not interested, we're not going to follow that law of right and wrong, it wouldn't make any difference. Because God's the authority, God says this is what's right, this is what's wrong, so whether you want to think of it this way or not, you gave yourselves over to lewdness and you worked on cleanness with greediness. That's what you did. But, verse 20, you have not so learned Christ. And by not so learned Christ, obviously he's referring to the gospel or the faith of the Lord at large, the concept of, of the characteristics that God wants in us that were embodied in Christ, that he literally lived in his, in his life for as an example and taught by his words. So now is the contrast from this is what, for many of them in Ephesus, having many of them would have been, had had been Gentiles and godless themselves, they once were like this, but this is not what you've come to understand and know as being a child of God. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Well, obviously, physically, it's unlikely that any of the individuals in Ephesus had physically heard Jesus or been taught by Jesus. But that's not what Paul's point is. Paul's point is that the gospel of the teaching of Christ is the same as being taught and hearing the Lord, which goes to show the authority of the apostles in teaching the gospel had with it the weight of the voice of the Son of God. Indeed, you have heard him, been taught by him. How? How, how would I have heard him or been taught by him? By hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, as taught for the Ephesians by Paul and by those who were with Paul, as the truth is in Jesus that you put off. Now, here's the application of this, which is a very important, has very important application today. That you put off, concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So notice this old man, that was that godless individual that grows corrupt or decays. Okay, yes, there's the physical aspect to that, but it's more so the spirit or the type of character that that individual had before they became a Christian. And the state of their soul because of how they used to live. That old man, the type of mentality, the th type of attitude, the thought process, what their, their motivations were, what their goals were, it was all for the flesh. It was all about my own desire and it was all about sin, whether they realized it at the time or not which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. I think that's an interesting phrase that Paul uses, deceitful lusts. Even in individuals who may have been, for lack of a better phrase, spiritual, these Gentiles who may have given themselves over to worshiping false gods, idols, okay, there may have been individuals who were religious or spiritual from that perspective, and maybe there was some sort of a, a sense of, of religion, for lack of a better phrase, as it pertained to the service in those, to those idols. Even, even those, however, did not have, first of all, the moral code, I say moral code, the law of right and wrong, which is what broadly humanity refers to as being a moral code. Uh, and the idolatry didn't contain all of that. And so even the things that seemed to be holy and seemed to be uh, in service to a God, things that they thought they were doing that would have been pleasing to a higher power, they were still deceitful lusts. Things that, you know, for instance, in, in worshiping idols, a lot of time fornication, other sexual activity was involved 
in the worship and in the rejoicing of a false idol or false god, an idol. And in that way, it's a deceitful lust because it takes on this appearance as being a good thing. You're doing this to praise this god of the Romans or of the Greeks. You're doing this to praise, as was the case, you know, for the children of Israel and the, the golden, the bronze uh, calf, a golden calf, uh, worshiping this god that they had created. It, it, it all kind of contained basically the vehicle by which they could do the things they wanted and yet still feel like they're serving a god. We're following this God's rules, even though they were the ones that came up with the rules in the first place, and it was only really a means to justify living and doing the things they wanted to do. So Paul says, you put that off concerning your former conduct. That old man grows corrupt in contrast to being renewed in the spirit of your mind. That spirit of your mind is the very thing which he's contrasting here, which grew corrupt under the old paradigm under the old way of thinking you are to be renewed in the spirit of your mind how through christ and in verse 24 that you put on the new man which was created according to god in true righteousness and holiness now obviously god created the spirit creates each soul each spirit of individual that that that's just i mean from the moment that we are uh conceived we have that soul or spirit but the new man that paul's referring to here in verse 24 is in reference to when an individual is baptized, their sins are washed away, as Paul refers to in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, we become a new creature. We walk in newness of life. And it's that new man that Paul's referring to, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, what does an individual have to do in order to have that new man created by God within them? To have that that soul basically made new made clean made fresh an individual has to obey the lord obey the gospel and part of that obedience is to repent to confess before men the lord jesus and to uh, be baptized for the remission of my sins so now paul's going to take that entire thought process and he's going to apply it now to actual life okay to actual conduct even though conduct has been alluded to, he talks about lewdness, uncleanness, greediness, um, deceitful lusts, and so forth. Now Paul's going to be specific with it as he addresses the Ephesians. Therefore, verse 25, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, he quotes from the Old Testament, for we are members of one another. Now, obviously, speaking truth with my neighbor can have very broad applications, but Paul applies this specifically among the brethren. It would seem as though in Ephesus there is an issue because Paul says we are to put away lying. He specifically brings out lying. Whether Paul's trying to head off an issue at the past that might be starting, or it's an issue that already existed in Ephesus, or Paul's simply making a specific point in addition to any other type of issue that could be used here as well, Paul brings out lying. He says, let, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. And he quotes the Old Testament to carry with it the weight of recognizing that God has always required of his people to speak truth with one another. That hasn't changed. And again, a lot of times the New Testament writers quote Old Testament to show the harmony of what God requires from his people. The just shall live by faith. That was true under the patriarchal law. That was true under the Mosaic law, and that's true under the law of Christ as well. While the laws have changed, and the means by which we serve God or worship God, uh, offer up praise to God and so forth, may have changed over each course of, of, of the law, the character that God requires of people of faith has never, ever changed. Not once. And so he says in verse 26, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Now he brings out another component. Uh, in addition to lying, he talks about anger. Or even more broadly, letting our emotions get the better of us, is how we might say that today. Letting our emotions kind of dictate how we treat others particularly. Uh, but even, even more generally, letting emotions cause us to sin. 
And I think this is a very, very important point that Paul, again, quotes from the Old Testament to show that this is not new, and it's also, it's also required of people of, of the Lord in Christ Jesus. He says, be angry and do not see. The scripture and Paul are not encouraging us to be angry. That he should, we should go around being angry. That's not what Paul's saying, and that's not what the Old Testament's saying. It's acknowledging that as human beings, there are going to be times where we're susceptible to our emotions. There are going to be times we get frustrated. There are going to be times we get angry. There are going to be times we get discouraged. There's going to be, I mean, there's, what did Solomon say? There is a time for every season under heaven. Okay, I mean, there's a time for everything. Uh, at, at some point in life, all these things are, are going to happen at some point. And we, it, it's up to us to deal with them the way God would want us to. and Or the way God does want us to. Not would want us to, but does want us to. Be angry and do not sin. And it goes to show that I can control my emotions. I can control and bring under submission whatever I'm feeling in that moment. I can bring it under control to con uh, make sure that my conduct is according to what God wants. So when Paul says, be angry and do not sin, you know, we hear these examples or, or claims of people in a fit of rage, they had no control over their actions. Now, I'm not an expert on the difference between anger and rage. Uh, I certainly can understand being so angry that you react. Sure, I understand that. But does that make it okay to do things that are wrong? No, it doesn't. And really, in a lot of ways, it puts the responsibility even more so on me to make sure I don't allow myself to move from anger into rage or hate. Because I'm not, I'm not going to argue with psychologists or other people who claim that, you know, well, when, when you have pure hatred or pure rage, you literally can't control yourself. Okay. But you could control yourself leading up to that and prevent yourself from a, becoming truly enraged or truly uh, uh, filled with hatred or bitterness. Uh, that, doesn't, that still doesn't absolve you of any responsibility by your conduct. And the fact of the matter is... The ideal uh, or the, the component of rage is very subjective. The component of hatred is very subjective. Just how far, just how deep do I have to go for it to be considered rage or hate? Uh, in the end, God created us to have emotions. That's the way we are. Some of us are, are maybe more connected to our emotions than others. Some of us are maybe uh, naturally able to control our emotions better than others. But in the end... We have emotions. That's just the way it is. But having those emotions does not, therefore, absolve us from our responsibility to serve God and his word and doing what's right or doing things that are wrong. Paul says, be angry. You're going to have emotions. That's going to happen. But you are fully capable of controlling your emotions so that you do not sin. And in fact, you should seek to do away with that with certain emotions whatever you need to do to resolve anger hate certainly rage uh any type of negative emotion that could certainly lead me down the path of temptation or lead me to sin i need to address it i need to deal with that so that that obstacle that that stumbling block is no longer in my way from being focused on serving the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so that's why Paul says, don't let the sun go down on our wrath. You need to address it. Get it out of the way. Don't give place to the devil. And sometimes people separate these two, nor give place to the devil. But, but the way Paul says this, it, it's connected. Giving place to the devil. Do you remember what it was that, that God told Cain when Cain was angry because Abel's sacrifice was accepted, but Cain's wasn't? Uh, God says in Genesis chapter 4, uh, in verse 7, this is after uh, the Lord asks Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Because Cain was upset. And God says, and this is a verse that to me, it just resonates from the very beginning of Genesis all the way through Revelation. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, 
beautiful statement by God attempting to help Cain. Cain doesn't listen. That's not God's fault. God allows Cain to make his choice. But the fact of the matter is, God gave guidance to Cain to help him in this moment, to help Cain deal with his emotions. God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Obviously, Cain didn't, but that's not the point. The point is... That what God says is that I have control. I need to be master of my heart and of my mind. I need to be master over my emotions. If I don't do well, okay, in and of itself, if I don't do well, okay, Cain's sacrifice was rejected. Well, Cain could have easily taken that opportunity to say, well, the next sacrifice I offer to the Lord is going to be what he wants. Whatever, however it was, whatever law, the law, the pay, whatever law Adam and Eve and, and Cain and Abel and the rest of humanity up to, well, up to Abraham, which we generally consider as being the patriarchal law, uh, whatever that was contained in the offering of sacrifices or anything else, Cain had the opportunity to do better. He had the opportunity to grow and to change and to do what God wanted. But he didn't. So sin is lying at the door because Cain was in the thralls of, of anger and jealousy and sin's desire was for Cain. But you need to rule over it. Instead, Cain let it rule over him. And this goes hand in hand with what Paul says here in Ephesians 4, verse 20, uh, where are we? Verse 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil, because by allowing these emotions to fester, by allowing these emotions to brew and simmer within us, and not dealing with them, not addressing them, and resolving them, what's going to happen? I'm doing the very same thing that's, that God said Cain was going to end up doing, which was to allow sin to rule over me. It's lying at the door and it's waiting. And this is exactly what Paul says. Don't give place to the devil because all you're doing by allowing those negative emotions to remain within my heart and remain active in my thoughts, I'm opening the door wide open for Satan and for sin. And so in verse 28, Paul says, let him who, steal, who stole steal no longer. Rather, let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. This is an issue that apparently was a problem uh, in the early church, whether or not these were true Christians or they were individuals who were just pretending to be Christians, hoping for people to take care of them so they wouldn't have to work. But this is something that came, comes up uh, also with the Thessalonians, uh, that apparently in Thessalonica this was an issue that there were certain individuals who were simply relying on the generosity of the brethren so that they didn't have to do anything uh, and just uh, took advantage of the goodness of the brethren. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When he says do not grieve the Holy Spirit, <laughs> the idea of grieving the Holy Spirit would be to... Uh, broadly, you could make the case that any sin would grieve the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and you could you could make you could make that argument. Uh, but I tend to look at this as trying to take advantage of Scripture, taking advantage of what the truth of God's word is, trying to find loopholes, trying to find excuses or, or, or twisting the scripture, twisting the teaching of the Lord in such a way so as to alleviate my own responsibilities, to uh, enable me to do what I want or, or to teach things that would be for my own gain. Uh, I tend to look at verse 30 as uh, kind of using things for my own ends, using the gospel and twisting it or whatever for my own purposes. I, I tend to look at that more so as grieving the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was a key component in the uh, inspiration of the writers of the New Testament, uh, the teaching of the gospel. 
Uh, and so I tend to look at it that way. But you could certainly make the argument very broadly uh, that all sin grieves the Holy Spirit. And certainly you could point out any one of these uh, if, if you wanted to suggest that Paul was specifically referring to corrupt words or stealing or giving place to the devil. All of that certainly would be true. Verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, and as Joe pointed out in his sermon, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before that, um, the importance of the forgiveness, obviously there's a component here of the need for, re need for repentance as well on the individual doing the whatever it is that was wrong. Even as God in Christ forgave us, well, what did God require of, of us to do? Well, we had to repent. We had to acknowledge we'd done something wrong and repent. And But we should be willing to do the same thing to each other. We should be kind and tender-hearted as opposed to bitter and angry and malicious towards one another. Uh, having said all of that, I think it's very important as all of this leads us to the understanding well, two, two main points. First of all, the idea that I can be a Christian, Christian in word, and believe myself to have a home in heaven, but not actually have to do anything or not have to worry about sin or, or controlling myself, controlling my life, controlling my thoughts or my emotions, that I can still be saved because I believe and that's all. Obviously, Paul was not convinced of that being the case. Uh, and for that matter, any of the other writers of the New Testament were not convinced that that was the case. That we actually have to, we have to put in the work. But then secondly, the fact that I had no control. I wasn't, I can't help it. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything to change it. Um, I had no choice. I hate that phrase. I had no choice. You always have a choice. Be angry and do not sin. God gives, God gives man the ability to be uh, his own uh, decider of what, what's going to happen to us. And how we live is going to dictate what our end is going to be. What the end result of judgment is going to be. But God gives us the means to control ourselves. Granted, some may have less control than others. You have people who are short-tempered and so forth. That just puts all the more responsibility on them to work harder at controlling those particular cons or that particular type of character, a particular type of, of anger, or whatever it may be. But we all have weaknesses. Some things affect us more so than they affect others. And different aspects of life may affect us, whether it's discouragement or depression or maybe it's anger or frustration, you know, whatever, maybe it's bitterness or whatever. There's certain, there's certain, there's certain things that we all struggle with that may be different from somebody else. And yet, God says, I expect you to control yourself and do not sin. You can feel, you can feel the things you feel. That's just the way it is. You feel things. That's how God created us. But I still don't want you to sin. Which means that your higher reasoning, your ability to judge, to have good judgment, that's the idea of all throughout the New Testament, Christians are called on being to be sober-minded, uh, to have sobriety. And it's the sense of being able to have proper judgment, to control our actions, to filter our thoughts in such a way that the, so that no matter how angry or upset we may be, I'm able to bite my tongue. I'm able to control my hands or my feet and make sure I don't do anything that I shouldn't do. And that I'm still submitting myself to the Lord, even when every human element of me wants to do something else. And I, I think that this really speaks to the responsibility not only of salvation, and, and certainly salvation is, is a part of this, but of the means of salvation, which is to please God. The whole basis of pleasing God doesn't begin and end with belief. It may begin with belief, but it continues to go forward in through making sure I control myself and making sure I am doing those things that he wants me to do. 
All right, that's the day of the devotional today. It's so oh, it's a lot longer than I anticipated, but uh, I feel like that's a that's a really important uh, important points that we need to remember, and certainly we need to be able to to share sometimes with others, especially when maybe they say things like "I couldn't help myself" or "I can't control it" or whatever. I had no choice. Things like that. Uh, well, God God says we do have a choice. We may not want to make a choice. We may not, or we may not want to choose to control ourselves. Uh, but that's part of what we have to fight as human beings seeking to be pleasing to God, uh, both in faith and, and uh, in spirit and in truth. All right. Our next devotional, Lord willing, will be tomorrow at 630. Hope to see you all then. Thanks, everybody.